Welcome to Life Changing Challengers, the podcast where passion meets purpose. I'm Brad Minus, your host, guiding you through stories of transformation and triumph from endurance feats to overcoming adversity. Our guests defy the limits and inspire action. Ready to ignite your desire and incinerate your barriers? Join us. Your journey to the extraordinary begins now. And welcome back to another episode of Life Changing Challengers. My name is Brad Minus, and I am your host, and I am probably the luckiest podcast host because on the show today, I have Heidi Beyer. She is a business owner, entrepreneur, artist, musician, songwriter. The girl has done everything, but she's made it her life's purpose. So without further ado, Heidi, how's it going today? Hello, Brad. I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. I'm so honored to have you and thank you. So without further ado, Heidi, can you tell us a little bit about your childhood, where you grew up, what was the compliment of your family, and what it was like to be Heidi as a kid? Wow, that's a lifetime of <laughs> learning. I was born and raised in New York, and I was born in Manhattan, Lenox Hill Hospital. I was the first child that my parents had. My parents are very young. I come from a Jewish background where we are... My parents really practiced Judaism. It was a real big part of their upbringing. I was the first of three. My dad was an entrepreneur. He was very young when my parents married. And this was a thing back in the day that a lot of people married young. So they were, what, 21, 23 years old and had a lot of dreams and desires. You know, we're always very focused on work and doing a good job and just very high work ethic, doing good things for other people. My father started, and I, and this is a lot about my father is how I actually took on a lot of his traits and who he is. And that's who I am today. So I, and he, they are a lot, you know, my parents are, are doing great. They're, they're loving life. They're actually living in Scottsdale, Arizona now. And, and I just always, you know, I always want the best for them because they have always wanted the best for me and for my brothers. I have two younger brothers and our lives are really rich. I mean, my father was just really young and trying to figure it out and he would get mentors as far as business goes. He's all business. You know, he had thought about being a doctor when he was younger, but instead he really just got pulled into being a business owner. So, you know, he bought a business really young and he had mentors who helped him. It was, he didn't do this, you know, without somebody kind of looking out after him or helping him through the process, but he got into retail. And back then I will say retail was a whole other thing. It was really people going to this, you know, a shop. And so he owned a a stationary store and this was he, that we bought that he bought in, we moved out to Long Island. So I was raised actually in Queens and Forest Hills. And then that my parents bought a house when I was what, five, six years old <clears throat> out on, on Long Island. This is on the South Shore in Baldwin. So, and then my brothers came along, you know, he, when he bought the store, I, I remember I have a distinct memory of me actually working the cash register when I was seven years old. So I can tell you, I already knew what I was going to be in for for the rest of my life. You know, it was really about kind of, you know, working the numbers, working the money. But I never came at it from a place of, of I've always came from a creative place. So it was never like, oh, I want to go into economics or I'm a finance person or finance manager or anything of that nature. It was more of a place of being an owner, you know, kind of overseeing all of the particular pieces that go into the puzzle. That's so much more interesting, which is a similar makeup that my father actually has always had. And then as we grew, part of my growing up in New York, the interesting part is that it was really about helping the family. So while they really created a strong foundation and structure such as Judaism, so that was our social life. You know, my parents became very involved in the temple. And then I became very involved in the temple and in my studies. Um, But it was more, not just, it wasn't about being religious, honestly. It was more about 
learning our culture and having a, you know, the connection with others. That was really the main part of our social, a part of that balance. So while I had that, and I was also very encouraged to be in sports, you know, ever since I was very little, you know, I got involved with playing baseball. Actually, I played boys baseball, which was something that as I grew, and this was maybe I was about 11, 12 years old, but I was the only girl in the league. (laughs) This was back in all. Only girl in the league. Only girl in the league. And I would, I actually made all stars. I made boys all star team. Beautiful. I know. And it was like I was very competitive. I also, my parents, you know, I got into tennis. Tennis was a, a big deal. And I, I mean, we now my, my parents had then bought a business up in Massachusetts. So we moved when I was after my bat mitzvah. We moved right up. We moved up to Massachusetts. So this was, and and the the thing is that it was very difficult. And I don't know if a lot of people have experiences where mo- they've moved around as a kid. And I know you that you were in the military. I don't know if that was something for you, but for me, moving around as a kid and being in New York, very entrenched in New York, I had a very, very strong New York accent. I've lost most of my accent, but. Going into, I guess it was like seventh grade and moving to Massachusetts, Western Mass, where funnily enough, yeah. it's the least accent yes. uh, area in the country where the bro- communications or broadcasters go to learn not in, in, in that part of the country, learn not to have an accent. Anyway, P.S., I had a really tough time. It was really tough acclimating as a girl. Um, and wanting to fit in. So that's kind of part of the story where, you know, I felt so different much of the mm-hmm. time. Anyway, so good. I don't know. I was just to say, that's interesting that, you know, you looked like everybody else, you behaved like everybody else, but because of your accent, you felt like an outsider. Most people are like, you'll be like, oh, you got an accent. That's kind of cool. Um, you know, something different, but you actually felt differently about that. Actually, I was very sensitive. And so uh, being sensitive and which is, uh, you know, it's from, a, I, and I happen to be in my life today, very spiritual. So, and spiritual where it's about kind of like just manifesting what you want, like law of attraction, things of that nature, yeah. and really kind of going deeper than I like to have deep conversations about things that that are, why are we here on the planet? You know, our purpose in life. And, it, and it's not about, oh, this is, you know, I'm, I'm all about let's help the planet. Yes, of course. But it's more about, well, how can I help? How can I be better for me? Because if I'm as good as I possibly can, then other people can see that and hopefully that will help them. Now, of course, it's, you know, just we're, we're all, we all touch each other's lives when we meet and, you know, there are people that you touch and there are people that you, you know, who don't relate to you. But the key is, you know, just to be the best person you can. So that that's all I've ever tried to, you know, that's how I've come to that. But the but going back, you know, I as being the the first child in my family, my dad had let me know this is actually in the past couple of years. He said, when you were born and maybe you were two or three years old, he said, I never had to worry about you. He said, you were always so confident and competent. He said, coming out of the womb, you were so competent. You didn't seem like you needed anybody or anything. You didn't seem like you needed me. You were just so filled with confidence and competence. And I just always knew that you would be successful in any venture that you did. So I, I took that as a real, I mean, to me, that was just such a compliment. While, of course, you know, that's kind of a shield for maybe, you know, being like you, if you come up looking and feeling like you're tough, you don't need anybody. But the truth is, is that the, the deep sense of wanting to belong and wanting to feel wanted and wanting to have connectivity to other people and, and really wanting to be known. And so that's been sort of the struggle that I have endured. That's part of my life's journey. 
But the key is with my relationship now with my brothers, just kind of going back to the family dynamic, was, I mean, it's so interesting. I was sort of the star of my family. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, firstborn, you know? <laughs> and I think my, my brothers felt, you know, kind of in, in the shadow of something that they couldn't necessarily, you know, kind of stand up to, or it took them a while to find their own, who they are, you know, and, and actually my, the relationship with my middle brother had always kind of been a bit fractured up until the last several years as we become really, you know, kind of strong adults in ourselves. But the relationship with my younger brother was a lot easier and was, I was able to feel like I could support him more. But the key is that, yeah, it was almost like I felt, interestingly enough, I felt like an only child. Oh, it was really kind of isolated. Kind of isolated, but on my own, where I was sort of just given the tools or given my parents were extremely supportive of anything that I did. And in fact, I also was very involved with theater and acting. I was encouraged to do I was involved in the clubs and I went to equity theater groups. I was always a top performer and the star of the show or wanted to go to performing arts school in New York, you know, and things of that nature that, you know, and, and would read variety. And I was like 12 years old, you know, so it was like there were, I dreamed of like, of, and I'm talking about not variety magazine, variety, the newspaper. Newspaper, right. Now in New York, where you get to see all of the you know, auditions. And I would dream of, you know, going to the auditions and getting representation and all of, all of that nature. So it's like I had a lot of pieces in my life. And the other piece growing up was becoming my, my I was encouraged to play an instrument. So the instrument that I, I had started playing, you know how when kids are in school right. there, it's like you're playing a, a flute or you're playing the clarinet or something in band, right? <laughs> and uh, so when I actually did try the flute, but the truth was I was like, forget this. I, I, you know, it's like as soon as I saw like guitar, I knew that that was for me, you know, that was my vibe, you know, that was where I wanted to be. It was like, forget about, you know, this whole band thing. So I started taking uh, lessons. I mean, actually, it was even before I was taking lessons, I picked up the guitar and somehow innately I knew how to write music. It was like the coolest thing. And it was also the most like, you know, like God thing, but it was also the most interesting thing. Like how, on, how would I ever have that intuitiveness to know how to write a piece of music? And a lot of it was just, you know, I mean, I, my first song actually was called The Sign of the Times, and it was so funny, but maybe like within, I don't know, a couple months, there was like a Prince song. Right. Prince, Sign, Sign of the Times. Exactly. Like, oh my God. It was like I had kind of channeled that, <laughs> that, and it was what I wrote. You know, I was very hooky, and I had really, I'm somebody who easily can, can write music and then write the words. And it's something that was always really fun and not really, and actually very almost, you know, I didn't, I didn't use this word when I was growing up, but therapeutic, you know, there was almost a yeah. very like a happy, my happy place. So you find a passion. And I think that's a lot of people is they find a specific passion. Now that might not be their life's journey. It might not be their, their end all be all, but it's something that they're very happy with. You just happen to find music. I like to draw parallels. I play the clarinet and the saxophone in high school. I also was in theater. My first bizarre production of Oliver Twist was sixth grade. Oh, my God. Um, I went through high school and college, and then I went into the military. The first time I got out, I was in D.C., and I started doing some equity stuff and some semi-pro. You know, it's enough to pay your gas to get to rehearsal and back. A Sign of the Times was huge. That was the second album after purple rain remember the bangles yeah yeah they had they had a song the sign of the signs i just remember sh going shopping with my mom you know up in upstate new york and and i heard that the sign of the times i think it was the bangles on the radio and i was a kid and i don't know it was just like we i just like oh i knew it 
I knew that would be a hit, you know, like my song. It wasn't my song, but this, the, the title, you know, it was like the title was out there in the ethers and I had just like kind of pulled from it. Isn't that now, cool? When you said that you kind of this innate ability to write music, are you talking about that you were able to strum, play a new a new melody yeah. and then put put words to it? Yeah. You're not actually talking about that you all of a sudden could go put a staff out there, write trouble um, stuff, and be able well, to write the notes. Right. It, I, I didn't really have... I can do that, and I could do that before. Yes, actually, I did, I did have a very elementary... Um, yeah. I knew the staff and I knew the musical notes. I knew theory. So when I first started picking up the guitar and taking lessons. Yes, I was taught theory. Oh, okay. Was that yeah. my, did I care so much about it? Only so that I would remember what I played and I could uh, build on that. Right. But as exactly. far as like, oh, was I, you know, like Mozart when he was a kid, you know, whatever, you know, would be able to do that. I didn't have that desire. That wasn't like, oh, you know, like, it wasn't yeah, as eloquent, fluent, and right. eloquent. It it's more truly innate from a creative. That's what I'm interested. That's what I've always been interested in. Right. Yeah. I um like I, a piece of something and then going, oh, my God, that's a cool tune. And then kind of, you know, watching it grow into something. Yeah. I had a really good friend when I lived in D.C. Her name was Jessica. She didn't really know the guitar. She just kind of picked it up and started fiddling with the different chords. And before you knew it, she came up with these amazing songs. And all of a sudden, she started singing along with it and doing open mics. And before you knew it, people started knowing who she was. And it was pretty cool. But then she had met somebody who was very fluent in musical theory. And he was astounded because he was like, you're just like doing trial and error to find out where these fingerings are and stuff. And you're coming up with these beautiful songs. You know what it took me after doing several courses in theory and everything, how it took me to do that. So yeah, I believe that you had an innate ability to, to pull this away because I've seen it with my own eyes. Yeah. And, and in fact, when you say it like that, about that guy who is super fluent in, in writing and theory, it's two sides of the brain. That mm. that side is very left brain. It's very rational. It's very by the book. The right side, which is what your what I have and what sounds like Jessica was all about, was you know that's the creative, that's the interesting, that's like your painting in the background there. You know, it's sort of oh yeah, yeah. It's kind of like I mean, for those that are watching on YouTube, <laughs> I'll uh, see if I can get a little bit better. But yeah. So that was drawn and painted by a group of cancer kids at St. Joe's Children's Hospital here in Tampa. Oh, what? Yeah, that was painted by them. And I had just recently gone to a leukemia and lymphoma gala. And that was one of the silent auctions. So I bid on it and then I got it. I'm not trying to toot my own horn or anything, but I donated it to the hospital so they could put it up. It's pretty big. It's five by six. And I'd given it to them. But unfortunately, it's canvas. So germs and bacteria will permeate it. So they were like, we can't take it. So I'm like, okay, it's going in the podcast studio, the podcast office, whatever you call it. So that's what I'm going to do to pull it to the back of the thing. I noticed it. It's really beautiful. Yeah. I mean, look, it's just a collection of ideas and the colors and the shapes and all of that. And then you've got like a guitar. You can see the actual yeah. neck of the guitar. I mean, so that's what we're talking about. The, the, the What's interesting about being creative and the right brain and having, you know, tapping into that, which is really about being the entrepreneur, which is really about trial and error, which is really about risk taking, which is all the connectivity to just you know what? Nothing is perfect in life. I mean, that's really the bottom line and being okay with allowing imperfection to be, to be perfection. I actually have a really great story no, bring about, it down. about really having that insight into it, into perfection, yeah. which is really based on imperfection. And it was a trip that I went to Paris. This is like in my 20s, out right after college, and I was going, I, a friend of mine who was, and I 
I'm out in LA and he was a big film guy. And he had one of the top films at Cannes Film Festival that year. Why don't you come for a couple of weeks? So I said, sure. So I decided to go to Paris and I went by myself on the trip. And of course, you know, it's really great when you travel alone because you can, I like to meet people. And I met people that I had really strong connection with that I had still can, been connected with for many, many years. So through go- going to Paris, of course, I'm going to the museum. And I happen to love the Impressionistic period, which is, yeah, you know, it's like the, the Van Gogh, it's like uh, the Picasso, it's like all of these periods like that are just super interesting to me. And anyway, so I'm going through one of the galleries and I just see one of the paintings And I'm so drawn to this painting. So I'm looking at it from afar and it's just, I mean, I'm I'm like in tears. It's so beautiful. I'm so moved. And I, it just struck me so deeply that I, I really started crying. And I had moved close to the painting at that point. And all of a sudden I see these pencil marks behind the paint. And I'm seeing marks that have been erased. And I'm seeing all these, you know, the drawing of the artist drawing all prior to him putting on the paint. And I'm seeing all the, you know, kind of like, if you will, the the mistakes. I looked at it and thought, oh my God, like there are the mistakes, there are the mistakes. And I went, isn't this fascinating? And I thought, and I actually had like an epiphany that this is what life is all about. Because when you're looking from afar, like I'll look at somebody, you know, and we were saying I, I live in LA. And of course, that you look and you see some really exquisite looking people. And I look at someone, I think, oh, my God, they must have a, they, you know, they have a wonderful life. They must have a wonderful family. They have somebody who loves them. And, it, you know, and you go on and you make up this whole story about the, about, you know, about somebody. And then I'm looking at this painting, and this is what intimacy is <laughs> now that I know that. But at the time, I was like, you know, this is about like p- the imperfection of the painting. And then I thought to myself, but that is what makes it perfect. And that's the analogy of life, is that you go close up to a painting, which is close up to a person or a human being, and you see, you know, you, they're not perfect. But that is what you love. That is what you come to love. And then you build the trust on that. And that's the relationship that now 30 years down the road, albeit, you know, somebody, you know, could just be somebody, you're a, a dear friend of yours that you haven't thrown away, <laughs> you know, that you still have around. That's the key to life is just building those relationships. Oh, I agree wholeheartedly. And then the nice thing that I think about is, But there's also those relationships that sometimes just end, but they were in your life for a reason, you know, and if you can spot that, you're like, this person was in my life because I needed to be taught something and they needed to be taught something. And we accomplished that together and we kind of went on separate paths. So we lost touch. Doesn't mean that you're not friends anymore. It doesn't mean that you're now enemies. It just means that you kind of float into, you know, to your own paths. For instance, like I was just mentioning, if I ever saw Jessica again, because I haven't talked to her in years because we went our separate ways, but it would literally take about five minutes and we'd be right back to where we were. Mm. You know what I mean? And you have those kind of people, but she came into my life for a reason. She taught me about music. She taught me about producing music because I produced some of her music. I didn't know anything about that. And we kind of took this journey together. We also were in a few shows together, but then, you know, we just kind of, went different paths, but those people will still be there inside you. So what I'm saying is that we don't naturally ever throw people away because of what you learned from them. And that's the piece that you take with you wherever you go. That being said, let's talk, go back into, let's say college. Did you go to school? Yes, I went to uh, Emerson College in Boston. Emerson is a private communication school. It, it was a school where there was a lot of like a lot of things that come up. Like you're young, you're trying to figure it out. And I always knew what I kind of wanted to do in film and TV. It's a film and TV school, essentially. 
Right. They have advertising also. And I just love, you know, as a writer, I love writing and I love kind of the poppy kind of quotes or coming out with things that would be really easy for people to remember. So advertising kind of was something that popped up in the midst of that I was the copywriter. I could come up with these really cool, simple, simplistic ads. In fact, I was on the radio when I was in Boston in college. I was one of the first and I got out to the radio, which was very hard as a freshman. I had a scholarship. And so part of it, it was work study. So I was working as a record librarian. That was a dream job for me because I got to meet all of these people who were like, at the time, radio was the thing. And WERS was the best Boston college, Boston station. And you could hear it all the way down to New York City. It had such a strong signal. So they would get a lot of celebrities up there, and it was the time of reggae. In fact, I got on the reggae show, and I had all the Rastafari come up there. It was like they loved to see that I had blonde hair, you know? (laughs) It was like I loved it. And yeah, I mean, it was like the time of Bob Marley, Rita Marley, and all. it was super cool. There was a lot of punk, you know, happening at the time, alternative, you know, stuff coming from England, from the U.K., it was like a really rich time. U2 was just coming out. Anyway, so that that was that part. And I was all into acting and just it, it kind of what happened was I something came up for me, which just was like a life changing experience, which was very difficult for me to deal with at the time. My family had moved out to Scottsdale, Arizona. I had transferred to ASU. And I was still doing, you know, the same communications. But what happened was I discovered, and it was through my own efforts, I found a talent agency that these guys had no idea they needed me. And in fact, when they write, and so they didn't, and I said, don't pay me, I'll do this as an internship, which they had no idea what that meant. It's very different. The East Coast has a different mentality than the West Coast or even Arizona at the time for, you know, kind of this whole thing about how people, you take on interns. Anyway, P.S., they, I ended up running the, the agency because these guys, all they wanted to do is party, you know, and, and go out and meet people and just kind of be the, the face of the business where now I'm running and I'm going to school for full time. In fact, I'm hiring, yeah, I'm casting friends that were in, you know, I'm in class with and, you know, all my, all my friends in movies and commercials. I mean, it was really quite, a, it's quite wild. And I was uh, running casting sessions and these were, you know, this is a sad franchise agency. So I really gained quite a reputation. I was like, like 22 years old, 21, 22, running the, this entire agency. It was really quite remarkable. Yeah. I've- been in audition those casting sessions many 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 times and they could either be run super well or they could be a mess that's an art right there but just the idea that you were running this talent agent while agency while you were in school that's incredible and you have done what you mentioned is something that i always kind of stick with like people that are in high positions right if you're a CEO, you're head of you're head of marketing, you're doing something like that, and you happen to have a friend who fits the bill the right way, use your power, you know? If you've got it, there's nothing wrong with it as long as that person's qualified. So for you to be able to put your friends into movies and commercials, that had to be fun just to sit there and say, hey, listen, I got this commercial. You'd be great oh, for it. Why don't you come right. out and read for it, you know? Our thing. I loved it. I just loved it. It was, it, but I was, you know, I mean, I was, I was just going to say I was lucky, you know, I made my own luck, but the fact is that, you know, it was a very fortunate, a very fortunate experience, you know? Yeah. 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 Awesome. And so That's when awesome. I graduated, you know, the whole point was to move out to LA and to become an agent, you know, to do that whole thing. And it was just a lot of, it was a lot of stuff. It was a lot. <laughs> I went through a lot. Yeah. <laughs> Diversity. That's where we need to go because that's what we want. We want to know what that was. So how you came out of it and now, you know, be a serial entrepreneur. 
So tell us about what happened in Los Angeles. Yeah. So, no, I mean, it w- I really it was there was it was a writer's strike. So remember the writer's strike of last year? So yeah. it was writer's strike in Plano. And it, yeah, there was nothing. Ha- there was no hiring. So although I had a ton of just a huge, thick referral base right. and so many people who would love to, you know, it was just at the time it was really tough for me to get in. And yeah, it was just a lot of learning about how how to kind of handle rejection. I even had family in the business and really knowing that you can't rely on other people. And I was really quite shocked. I know so many people do have people that help them easily and effortlessly with love. And that just wasn't my experience. And it was sort of like, do your own thing. Yeah, you have to find your own way. And that's kind of how it's always been for me. I have never had anyone sort of open doors. I've had to sort of kind of sit back and allow myself, well, should I go here? And I that's what's allowed me to, I will say the word allowed me to go in various directions rather than just, you know, getting really overwhelmed and upset, not doing anything, which is never my who I am and the threat of who I would ever be. Or it's sort of like, you know, kind of seeing what or what do you, what do you, you know, just kind of going with it and really allowing whatever experiences that you get to learn through each and every experience. So what happened was I had a friend of mine who was in the garment district. And so I thought that would be a really great gig for me. Uh, instead of being a talent agent, and not that people that I couldn't get in, it was just really tough. I kept going through interview in, and nothing, was, it wasn't easy. So I sort of just made some alternative. Yeah, I had to work, you know, I had to make right. money. And my parents were like, not going to fund any, not giving me money. In fact, when I first moved to LA, I was on my cousin's couch right they lives right by the ivy off the rock by around the block from the robertson from robertson and just an apartment and he was an editor and she was in advertising at at, at, at then shia day which was a big advertising agency and so they were really cool about letting me stay on their couch but after like i, I guess maybe it was a week or maybe it was a little less maybe it was just a couple of days it was like you have to go find your own place and i didn't know what to do. So my parent, so my mother said, well, why don't you go over to the Jewish Federation <laughs> and ask them to put you up, get, they'll give you, you know, money or they'll get put you up in a hotel. So actually, that's what I did. I went over there and they do have like vouchers. And they'll put you they put me up at a, you know, it wasn't like a hotel motel, nothing. It wasn't fancy, or anything, just for a couple nights. For, so I could figure something out. And during that interim, yeah, I had a, actually, there was a couple things that popped up with a friend who said that they knew somebody. So it was sort of like from there, I was able to kind of find a place that I could actually, you know, live. I don't know what happened quite there, but it, it was it was the bridge that I needed to kind of land somewhere in which I did. And then, so in looking for work, you know, I was, let me go down to the garment industry. That's, that would be great fashion. I've, I'm always into fashion and yeah. And I started working at a showroom and I actually, I experienced some harassment. This was really, I never talked about this ever. Mm. Yeah. I actually was the owner of this particular brand, this garment brand, the showroom. He was a coke. He was an older man, and I guess they do a lot of drugs. I've never been into drugs, but he was into doing what you know, doing coke. And I just know that I was the girl at the desk answering the phones and making the appointments. And he would come over and he would try to you know kind of put his hand in certain places and do certain things to me. And he would also raise his voice and yell at me and. I was definitely harassed, sexually harassed, but, you know, here nor there at the time, nobody brought up. It was sort of like, well, what am I going to do? So what I did was I actually had uh, the newspaper because we had newspapers back in the day. (laughs) 
<laughs> well, I just... look for work on my lunch break. So I actually looked at ads and I saw this one ad that said the chosen few. I kid you not. <laughs> the chosen few. And it was for an executive recruitment firm. And I thought to myself, I knew what recruiter was. And I thought, well, recruiter, talent agent, recruiter, talent agent, same yep. difference. And this company was based in downtown LA. So I knew that I could get there on my lunch break right. Right, and not have a problem. So I went over to the chosen few and I met this guy. He was this gay guy who I absolutely fell in love with, Christian. And they hired me right on the spot. And I was, it was the lucky, well, luck, you know, it was the most fortunate. I got out of that situation that I was was so antithesis of anything I've experienced before. It was so scary. And I was able to get out of there. And, you know, that was the thing. And my parents were behind the scenes supporting me, telling me that they're not giving me money, but I could figure it out on my own. And this is sort of how it's always been, you know? And not that they didn't want to not give me money, but it's always been like, even when they've had money, it's always like they don't have money. (laughs) There's this thing where they always felt like they never had money, even when they had plenty of it. No, that is a typical Jewish trait. I have grown up with that myself. And yeah, it's like, no, 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 no. Well, we don't really, we don't really want to buy the, you know, oy vey. I mean, it's just like, that's so expensive, but it's like normal. It's like competitive pricing. And all of a sudden it's like, oh my God, it's so expensive. What are we supposed to do about that? And I, and, but yet they've got, you know, a couple million dollars stashed in the bank. Right. It's always about it's, you know, and I think that's part of some, some Jewish antithesis is the fact that, no, it's always about tomorrow. It's always about tomorrow. No, no, no. If I spend it now, I'm not going to have it for later. Right. And uh, yeah, it's just, <laughs> and so it's like, no, no, no. You don't need the hamburger now because you're going to need it later. You know, you're not going to get French fries now or ice cream because you're going to want it later. It's the right. same thing, right? I don't know if you grew up the same way with me, but have when you. my grandparents, just, and this is the same thing, right? Grandparents would be like, hey, you should eat something. You should eat something. Go ahead. Eat, eat, you got to eat. Oh, my God. And they'd be like, they go up to 90 minutes before dinner, right? And they'd be like, ah, eat, eat, eat. And all of a sudden, 89 minutes before dinner, what are you eating over there? We're going to have dinner here. Just exactly. exactly. Oh, my God. That's exactly it. It's always about the future, the future, the future. Yeah. 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 I get that. So you got out of that. And, and- have, you know, so the fear of not having. And it, it actually, it's still in me. I mean, look, you know, I'm the product of my family and it's in my DNA. And there's that fear. That, yeah, I mean, something's going to go wrong. I'm not going to have anything, to, you know, and I'm going to be out on the street. So <laughs> that never has happened. But, you know, it's always like, right. is that it's that like that Jewish fear that's just so annoying. Yeah. Anyway, P.S. I start at this recruiting firm and it's we're in the, it's in the legal area. And I, I and I kid you not. From that point to six months later, I made $100,000. And how I did it was I got, and and this is what happens when you're forced to, you know, when you are put up with where you're not, where you have nothing and you're forced with such this adversity that you just work it out and you figure it out. I picked up Napoleon Hill's Think and Grow Rich. Mm -hmm. I read it cover to cover. It's the little book. And I studied it. I swear there's this plan. It tells you step by step. It's the cookbook recipe of how to do it. Right. And I followed that cookbook recipe. And I made $100,000 in six months time. Okay. So yeah, you worked out some sort of contract with these guys, with the recruiting firm, or you basically were working on a drop up commission? I worked there. I was a, I was a recruiter. Right. So it was draw plus, plus commission. And it had occurred that because of a commission base of yeah, recruiting commission. people. And... It was all commission. I mean, it was 100% commission. Yeah. Nice. It could or break it. Mm-hmm. So just to put the education out there, because when people hear recruiter, they're like, oh, that means that you, you know, you worked at an office and got people jobs. I've worked with so many recruiters on both sides. 
And it's people don't, you, we don't understand that, hey, those are guys that come to you to get you the job. A piece of your paycheck that you get every week goes to that recruiter. As long as you stay in that job. No, that, was, no, 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 that not, wasn't back. It is now. But. That's a temp agency. Mm, that, that's uh, a temp agency. For, 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 recruiter, an executive recruiter. And I'm just sharing, this was my experience. Yeah. This is also oh, flat B. It was a flat B. Yeah. Okay. So I, yeah. you know, the fee came right away. It wasn't like, oh, you stay. It was like, oh, you don't make it in a year. You make it, you know, if it, if it, it was like, let's say the person's salary was 150,000. So you get a, what, 10% commission or right. whatever it is, you know. Yeah. So we were and I worked because it was basically, it's, you know, IT management and executive. There's a contract. So if you're contracted for one year, the recruiter will get a piece of your salary for the whole year because they want you to stay in it. And the minute you leave, they lose it, right? So that's the model. Put as many people into their client's hands as possible, and each little one gives you a little bit each time. But if they fail, then you lose it. But there definitely still is the fact that you put up people. Now, the other thing is that there's always eventual stuff where people get hired. So they're on contract for a minute, and then they get hired. If they get hired within the contract, then there's more money that goes to the recruiter because they hired you out of it. Or once they finish the contract, then they can be hired without, you know, any extra money going to the recruiter. But that's just a little bit of education for everybody. Because like I said, I've been on both sides, but that might, that definitely an, an executive recruiter might, there might probably more flat fee than reoccurring. Yeah. So, you know, from there at that point, you know, I was able to really go back into my creativity. So that was the whole point. But everything that I've ever done is really to set myself up for freedom, for having time, for the free the freedom of time, having the funds to basically take care of my time to do whatever I want and to be able to be creative and enjoy that part. So that was the whole purpose of me, you know, when I say, boy, I made this money. Well, that was really about me then kind of having a platform to go and do my creativity, right? Nice. So at that point, I really focused on connecting with my music, and that was where I went. I was doing acting at Stella Adler, you know? Oh, Stella. Yeah, sure. My teacher, he was a big commercial kind of bit actor on shows, and he said, you really need to go get yourself an agent. And I, I really appreciated that, but I was really very focused on my music. That's where I wanted to, that's where I wanted to go. I was really hoping to get signed and be kind of like a Sean Colvin or a Suzanne Vega at the time, or just a female singer, kind of singer songwriter. That was where I was at. That's what I was aiming for. Nice. Um, so I was recording, taking the money that I made. I put a band together, playing out, doing that whole thing. Yeah. Hmm. So basically what you're saying is that you're trying to get to the point where you weren't trading hours for dollars, that you would spend a certain amount of time, make a bigger amount of money, put it away, and, and then be able to do your creativity. So you didn't work as hard or, or as long, and then you were able to focus on what you really loved, freedom, right? Well, that was the dream. That's right. So you started performing or you started writing and stuff. What happened there? I have such a great business head, right? Like that's such a big deal in my life as I've shared with you. I had a dear friend of mine who was also doing the same thing. We would kind of support each other. She really took her stuff out on the road. Like she would go and, you know, go play, go into all the cities and take her, you know, whatever CDs at the time, you know, the records, and then go out and try to get her stuff sold and play out at these little venues. And I just thought, no, <laughs> that's not what I wanted to do. I had no desire to really do that. Zero, honestly. So I just kind of, you know, allowed myself to go through that. I did everything that I possibly could at the time with the whole recruiting thing, some other stuff came up for me with my life. And so I, I took a turn, which was me focusing more on my personal life. Like I really wanted relationship was really important. So I started really trying to put some effort into that. And I didn't at the time have the skills to really have balance with my personal and my work life. 
So I was really focused on that. And then I wanted more creativity. And there was a downturn in, in the industry. So I moved on to some other creative ventures like becoming in production. I worked for a producer. And then I actually worked at Variety. And I became a writer. I, I had some bylines. So I really networked and had a lot of time with people kind of in that space, really trying to figure out, you know, how can I get to the end result has always been about freedom of time, getting to a place of having more time and doing the things that I love to do. And from there, it was sort of, you know, taking, I started a business. I had worked with an event management company. I became the top producer. Any company I've ever worked with, I've always been top. It's like they've never seen anything like it before. So, you know, I've, it's that to me, I've always wanted to translate into my own experience, into my own um, business, right. into my own projects. I had worked for this company and then I went off with a partner and we opened up our own company. We did event management. We did professional level diversity career events. We traveled the country and we have a phenomenal reputation. And then, you know, from there, I kind of moved some of the funds and moved into more real estate holdings, you know, wanting to flip houses and get into that whole thing. So I've had a variety of, you know, just taking risks, finding ways, doing anything I can to really allow myself to position myself to find things that I love. And through that as well, you know, it's like I've become, I've had friendships that developed that were very spiritual. So I found a whole spiritual side of myself, which, you know, was what at the time it was city yoga, which is something I've been uh, involved with for many years. And, you know, which is about selfless service, giving back. So it's not all about me. And it's really, you know, kind of finding a way for me to take, you know, all uh, to have a richer experience of my life more than just myself. And so these are practices now that, that while I had I had been a part, you know, a devotee, a participant for 30 some odd years. You know, I meditate on a, on a daily basis. This is part of my morning, you know, my morning routine, my morning meditation. So gratitude, having a practice of gratitude. So, yeah. I want to ask about, so you basically said that whenever you landed in a spot, you usually became top of the pyramid. You know, you were a top performer at the talent agency, at the, at the executive recruiters firm, the event management place, what can you, what do you attribute that to? You, I'm, yeah, let's put that out. What do you attribute it to? Yeah, that is, that's actually a brilliant question. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah, that is the $100 million question. I just really feel that I have this insatiable desire to really help others and to be of service. It is no joke. This is something that I really came in with. And I find that I most successfully can execute in a business work environment with other people. And when I say it like that, it means that, yeah, in my personal space, it's not as well, of course, I have really nice and beautiful connections. It's a different skill set. In the workspace, you have more control over how you can help other people. And you can really find that there's so many people who are desiring somebody to come in and hold their hand and help them through ways to become better in their business life and to expand their businesses, to be to actually you know, that for whatever I am, that I align myself with, that they will be better for being a part of whatever I'm actually aligned with or that I'm doing or that I'm selling or that I'm providing or service I'm providing, anything of that nature, because I have really good taste, I feel. So, oh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you heard it here, ladies and gentlemen. Hi, Heidi Beyer, the, the the most modest person in the country right now, <laughs> and she knows by fact she is self proclaimed that she has good taste. 
Okay. No, no, no. Just kidding. Uh, Let's just add that with humility. Okay. But yeah, no, I get it. I had a couple positions where I had teams underneath me and I was one of the first people that would always go in and they would ask me, well, what's your management style? And I'm like, everything's about the team. Nothing is about me. Everything's about the team. Instead of them thinking they report to me, I'm their boss, I'm their supervisor. No, I am their resource. If they need something, that's my job to make sure they get it so they perform their jobs to the utmost of their ability, whether that be coaching, that be education, whether that be pens and pencils, whether whether that be, hey, they need an extra day off or they need some time off in order to remove some friction from their lives so that they could be more present at work. I'm like, I'm the one that, 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 that is there for that. You know what I mean? Obviously within reason. And what I found was if I treat my employees like that, my staff, and I treat them as, you know, that they're my clients, they will work harder for me because they know that I'm going to provide them with every, everything possible to make their sure that they are a success. And hey, I lost great people because they became so successful that they got, you know, that they ended up um, getting better opportunities. I, I'll never forget those times when people are like, going, hey, you know what? It's really, really sorry, Brad, but I just got this job and they're going to want to make me a VP and blah, blah, blah. And I was the first one to say, go, have yourself a great time. This is why you were placed on my team. It's a sad to see them go, but they're going to someplace better where they can become the person that they were meant to be, where they can take that next step, which is what this podcast is all about, helping you make the next step in your life and where you want to go. All right, let me get off my soapbox. But yeah, so I, I know where you're coming from. You know, may I be of use was a top thing, that top motivator for me as well. So you ended up doing some more creative stuff. So tell me about how you, because you're just talking about city yoga and you're coming to that, that seems to kind of go into what you're doing now, kind of like folds right into it, right? Yeah. yeah. So BU Renewed is, is Heidi's company. Yeah. And I am going to hand that over to you because I love the products. I haven't tried them yet. Yeah. But when I looked at the descriptions, I know of a couple of things I'm ordering. So. Well, we'll take really good care of you. Don't worry. <laughs> the, uh, yeah. The, the, um, Honestly, I have been the head stuff, the, the renew, stadium. the yeah, the stack, the H stack, and the right. memory stack. Drop yeah, back. that's the, I'm totally yeah. freaking into that. Yeah, me too. In fact, that was the whole thing. You know, I guess it was maybe 15 years ago. I'm just going to be totally, you know, late. I'm going to be totally ident- uh, honest here. Not that I, not that I'm not being honest, but it's just I'm going to be totally like tell you the story. I remember reading. I think it was or hearing about this four-day work week, this Tim Ferriss four-day Ferris. week, right? You. And it just, it stuck in my craw. You know, I mean, it got stuck there where I'm thinking, and he was doing it with supplements. And at the time, I was using supplements. I've always, like, I'm a health person. I know that you are, you know, huge health. I've always worked out in the gym. I have so many things that I do health wise. I love cardio. I love hiking. I love being outdoors. I'm all about staying in great shape. And I just always want to look good living in LA. I care so much about making sure I not just looking good, but I feel better for it. So it's like the inside out, but then it's the outside in because when I know I look good, I feel good too. So there's both sides to that equation. So I'd always thought, you know, really, I love that concept of, you know, of, of helping people with with their problems, utilizing supplementation or supplements or vitamins, minerals. And so I must be using supplements now for the last, I would say, let's say 15 years, right? To me, I just always felt better for it. And I always knew that when I was taking, it was energy, I was feeling happy. I was feeling whole. Now it, it might have been maybe more mind, like my emotional, like maybe I would take it and I would just feel better. And it was my mindset, you know, I just felt better, but I really do feel better period for it. That's why I, I do take supplements. But so as now I'm, you know, just, you know, around the 50 mark, 
I, you know, I can see how, you know, the aging thing is really important to me. So I always want to like be, you know, my age gracefully and be as young as I possibly can and, and not have to, you know, worry about going, getting the facelift, which if I am thinking about, <laughs> yeah, I like all these things and I haven't done, you know, certain things in my life, you know, getting some, you know, plastic surgery and whatnot. But, but, the, but I think the bottom line is, is that what can I do from the inside out to feel good, looking good, so I look good to feel good, you know, from the outside in. And that would be, you know, kind of what the latest technologies are with for aging, for just having great sleep, anxiety, stress. So we didn't really talk about this, but, you know, it's like connecting with, you know, times that where I do feel out of touch or I do feel disconnected, feeling really a sense of just this really serious amount of loneliness. And even though I have people around me, there's just this like, you know, like, because I have expectations. A lot of it is around expectations, high expectations of myself always. And I don't give myself a break. And my mind is always racing. So, you know, um, even though I meditate, right? (laughs) I'm sorry, you you're like one of the only one other person besides myself that has referred to monkey mind in the correct context. And I am like, that thrills me because that's how I started meditating. Because as I was reading and somebody talked about monkey mind, I'm like, that's me. I yeah. totally am like that. Yeah. If I can't figure out a way to calm down, I can't sleep. So it totally is. I, it make sure makes you happy. Yeah. Make sure heart happy. <laughs> uh, yeah. Because it makes me not feel alone. Right. You know what else talked about it? And I always talk about it. You'll understand. Um, yeah. Yes. Yes. The minute you said that I was all in. Point. That's what we trigger for other people is, you know, we find our people no matter where we are. I love the concept that I could find people around the planet. I can find people around the entire country, all parts, all regions, because, you know, I love people in every section of the country. In the South, I love the South. It's the most hospitable place on the planet. You know, I love the Northeast. The, the intellect is just an, out of the, you know, that's just like the focus. So it's like, you know, you have different regions and people are people and all they want is to be loved and to love and to have the best opportunities in life, you know, and not everybody does it at the level, like as an entrepreneur that we might do, but you know, it's like, we all recognize, we can recognize different things in each other. So yeah, like, so when I'm, you know, in the best place possible, you know, I really feel like everything I'm doing, my whole routines are at their optimal. And so I really thought, gosh, I would love to develop. And I thought, well, if I can create a system and these are, so I have Be Renewed has three flagship products. One is called the Age Well System. I don't know. We have the morning formula, which is stage one and the evening formula, which is stage two. And so this is meant as a two pack duo to really be all of the ingredients that one could use to actually feel as young as possible, vital, energetic. It helps with joint and emolliation, the water in your body and to going through your joints and having you feel just as fresh and alive and your skin is, you know, it it helps with wrinkles. So these are the things that this does for you. We also have a well-being system. The well-being system is anti-anxiety. The well-being system, stage one, it's stressor, stress relief. And stage two is your sleep. It really, and I use these products. This knocks you out in a good way. You wake up and you're like alive and you feel like you're ready and fresh for the new day. And we also have the Stay Sharp system, which is our nootropic, which helps with focus and productivity. It has your executive bees. So that is your energy, which actually dials you in. These are fantastic products. And the formulas that I had developed over the last five years, actually really coming into what are the best vitamins, minerals, and herbs that could go into the formulas that would be where they would not interfere necessarily with somebody who's on medication. And everything here, we always tell you, please, if you're not sure and you have questions, if it's going to interfere, 
potentially with what your doctor prescribes. You absolutely, you know, we recommend talking to the doctor. But the key here is that there are studies, clinical studies, over 300 of them with these particular systems. They're organic. They're gluten-free. We give a one-year guarantee anyway. So, you know, please, please feel free to to try and we will, we'd love to have you as a, as a customer. Oh, no, I'm in. The URL that is under Be Renewed is it's very simple. It's burenewed.com. And I'm assuming that BU is BU. That's right. <laughs> B- so, see, B- see. B- so, exactly. So, here is Heidi leading with service. She wants you to be the best you that you could possibly be. And she's developed these products around things that are, you know, not to compete with your regular medication and to help you become the best person that you could possibly be and stay like, by a little bit of aging and just be you. So that's, that's where this comes from. So that's burenew.com. I will have, have a link down in the show notes uh, because I don't know when this is going to air right at the moment. But if you use BU25, there's a 25% discount on that. Heidi does her own videos as far as how to use the system. So you can get a chance to see Heidi again right on the website. Where is the best place for people to ask questions besides the site? Do you take part in social media? Absolutely. We have a really fabulous Facebook page. So you can go to BU Renewed on Facebook. We have BU Renewed Official on Instagram. Fantastic. We do have TikTok. It's BU Renewed. My email address is just Heidi at BU Renewed.com. Please feel free to reach out if you want. I will. The phone number is on there. Feel free to call yeah. me. I will make sure that all of that is linked right into the show notes. You'll have access to all of that. So we are total supporters here, life-changing challengers of Be You Renewed and their products. So give it a shot. And, you know, when you listen to this podcast, go ahead and hit the like button. If you're watching on YouTube, follow us. We're going to have great more episodes than this. And if you can, after you order, come back and write a little comment. Tell us how you felt about it. Leading with service to you. But anyway, Heidi, man, this has been amazing. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us today. I think this is going to be an amazing episode. I can't wait for people to listen to you and your passion about leading with service, about constantly thinking about the other person, which, you know, if you help others, you will help yourself. And I think that you lead by that. You lead that example for everybody. And thank you so much for doing that as well. Thank you. And... Until next time, we'll see you then. Well, that wraps up another episode of Life Changing Challengers. I'm your host, Brad Minus, saying thank you for joining us on this journey of transformation. If today's story has inspired you, please take a moment to review, share, and follow us on your favorite podcast platform. Your support helps us reach more listeners and creating an even bigger impact. Remember, every challenge is a chance to grow. Until next time, Keep pushing, keep challenging, and never stop pursuing your extraordinary.